Well, goodness. Well, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. We are here to talk about meeting mayhem. It's an adversarial thinking game. And just to prove that we're going to have slides for you, here are the slides we're going to have for you. Adversarial thinking is not something you tend to think about that much. It's considering the role an attacker might have in the system. It's not very, it's not taught that well. In an algorithm class, you teach about attack methods to justify why you're teaching a specific algorithm. It's only until you get to the advanced cybersecurity classes that they teach you enough to, to tell you how to probe a network for open ports. Corporate programs teach you to defend against phishing attacks and the common level things, but no, nobody tends to teach adversarial thinking as an idea, as a mindset. So for the protocol analysis lab, which is a different project that we have presented here at the cyber defense lab, we had a pen and paper game called the protocol game. It was an introductory lesson to teach you about why we need protocols and why we need to analyze protocols. Players would have slips of paper they would pass around. The instructor would take those slips of paper, rewrite them and pass them on. The players would try and communicate and they would get frustrated because the instructor has all of the power to rewrite to deny messages. It was very good at introducing adversarial thinking, it, very good at showing why protocols are needed. It served the best role in introducing the whole protocol analysis concept. It segued right into teaching basic protocols like Needham Schroeder, which in turn segued into protocol analysis. But that's about all it taught to not teach good practices. It was also not scalable. One instructor can only hold so many pieces of paper. Most importantly, in these days, it required an in person meeting. And as you can see, that's not a very possible thing these days. So, introducing meeting mayhem, it's an educational web based game to teach adversarial thinking using the dull of Yao model. That's a big word. We'll show it next slide. It's a Multiplayer game for three to eight players, though, of course, it can be scaled up to multiple concurrent games of as many people as you can fit on the Internet. The, game, the role of the game is for players to establish a meeting time and place for a pretend meeting by sending messages through a network that an adversary controls. The Dolivial Network Intruder model is the model we use for testing protocols. It is a model where basically the adversary has total control of the network. They can intercept messages. They can decrypt messages if they have the key. They can deny messages. They can rewrite messages. It is one of the stronger models for holding protocols up to. If a protocol can withstand going through the Dolby L network control model, it is a pretty good protocol. Julie. Thank you. So, uh, the main objective of Meeting Mayhem is to help students to understand what it's like to be pitted against an adversary with almost total control over the network. Um, as we said, the Dolivial adversary can intercept, modify messages, delete them entirely, perform cryptographic operations, whatever he feels like, really. Um, at the same time, the players are shown tools and techniques to counteract these adversarial methods. The important thing to remember, though, is that this isn't a game about specific techniques. It's a game about thinking. It's about understanding how your adversary thinks and how you must think to counter him. That's why we called Meeting Mayhem, if you recall from our first slide, an adversarial thinking game. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> All right. Um, as far as the philosophy of this project, implementing this type of learning in the medium of a game has the advantage of interactivity, um, authentic cybersecurity activity. Rather than being told how to think the game uh, format presents the topics at hand more as puzzles to be worked through, um, providing a deeper understanding of the material. Concepts are introduced gradually in stages, uh, allowing the students to become familiar with one topic before rushing on into the next. Additionally, um, at the start of the game, the student's arsenal of tools to use against the adversary is quite limited, um, helping to players to understand the strengths and limitations of each tool and to appreciate and utilize new ones when they're introduced properly. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, the student's performance over the course of the game is evaluated in several ways. This is a teaching tool. After all, each round of gameplay is scored automatically, and then a separate evaluation occurs at the end post game. Um, as far as the automatic scoring, wins and losses in this game are evaluated on an individual player basis. Each player has the chance to win or to lose every round. If you manage to meet with another player, you win. If you meet with the adversary, you lose. Uh, and in addition to these conditions, we're going to have a little point system, awarding points for good use of available tools, etc. They're sort of style points, really. It's just an understanding of how well you're handling the new material. Um, and after the game has been completed, a questionnaire um, will be filled out by the students, reflecting their understanding of the topics taught by Meeting Mayhem. Uh, these results will be compared with a control group study provided by CDL's CATS team. Next slide, please. Okay, wonderful. Here we have an example of the player view uh, during an early round of gameplay. This is what the player sees. Each player um, composes a message and sends it on to the adversary at the start of each round. The adversary does whatever he wants with the messages he's received and passes them on to the players, and this cycle repeats uh, until everyone's chosen. Uh, go back. <laughs> until everyone's chosen a meeting place and time. Early on in the gameplay, the players can really only specify the content of their messages and the sender and recipient. Uh, as the game progresses, more options are made available, encryption, signing, and so on. And speaking of encryption, um, I have a little example here to further clarify how some of these tools will appear in gameplay. So on the left, we can see a plain text message, which has been received by a player. On the right, we have an example of how encryption is handled in Meeting Mayhem. Uh, the message is simply blocked off from the recipient unless he or she has the required key. This isn't a game about encryption after all. It's a game about problem solving and an introduction to all these topics. Agreed? Yeah, thanks, Judy. So uh, when we proceed with the development of the game, uh, we thought of different roles that a user like to play through. So various roles are the game master, players, and adversary, and spectators. With game master, I would say game master is an educated person who knows about uh, different tools and he or she can control the access of tools to the players and an adversary. So the reason uh, we have thought it should be optional is because it's not necessary every time we have an educated person who would know about these tools. So we did not want the game to be dependent on a game master. I will talk about that later in the next slide. A user can register themselves as players. Oh, yeah, this slide. So user can register uh, themselves as players. Players are people who actually try to communicate and uh, come to a consensus of a time and place where they desire to meet. The messages that players send, so let's say Alice is sending a message to Bob and Alice and Bob both are players, the messages would be uh, intercepted by an adversary. So instead of Alice sending a message directly to Bob, it would go through an adversary. And the adversary, uh, if chose to modify those messages or we spoke about adversarial thinking, would uh, do the required action and uh, direct it to the receiver. So we would be having one adversary in the game. The last role is the spectator role. Uh, I believe the spectator role is a good way of learning because the spectators can see what's going on around in the entire round. They can see what messages players intend to send to each other, and they can also see how the adversary is modifying those messages. So a spectator can also be a learner without uh, himself playing the game. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I was talking about two different game styles when I spoke about uh, making the game master optional. With the structured game style, that is without the game master, 
we plan on having difficulty levels starting from beginner, intermediate, and advanced. The tools like hashing, encryption, and signing, and uh, different uh, abilities that the players and the adversary could can use will uh, move ahead as the level progresses in the game. And uh, that's how uh, we do not need an informed game master to be able to educate, but the game would be self-educatory to the players and to the adversary as well as to the spectator. The uh, second option is unstructured. That is when we do have an educated game master and uh, he or she can take the control and uh, decide how the game can be progressed. And uh, that, that would be a different style in which the game master would like to educate the players. Next slide, please. So this is a traditional client server architecture that we came up with. Uh, as we can see, we have a front end and a back end. In the back end, we have a database. Currently, it's SQLite. Uh, that is a relational database. And the website or the game app is the Flask API that is handling communication between the front end and the back end. Front end can be composed of different views, as we saw. We, we would be having an adversary, we can have a game master, we would we could have spectators and the uh, users who are technically the players. Uh, so uh, this is the traditional client server architecture. Uh, next slide. There's another proposed serverless architecture using the AWS Lambda. The difference between the previous and the and this particular architecture is we do not have a single persistent server. Instead, for the uh, API, uh, we have the Amazon API gateway that connects a backend with the front end. Oh, uh, sorry, there's a correction. It's not SQLite. The database is SQL Alchemy. Um, um, sorry about that. That is for the previous slide for the database that we are using. Uh, but in this, we propose uh, having a uh, Amazon Dynamo database that is non-relational. It is very heavily scalable if we want to store more number of messages. The advantages of having AWS Lambda is that Lambda functions are stateless, individual responsibility functions, and they can use persistence to rate, read or write data. Uh, AWS can spawn up and spawn down as and when users hit the API gateway. Uh, so that is how the scalability problem is handled through the serverless architecture. So scalability is nothing but a race against time. Maybe initially we have less number of users and uh, the load can be handled with the client server architecture. But uh, as and when the number of users, if the game becomes really famous and we have more than 1 million of users playing that game, uh, that's when the scalability can be a problem if we are using the traditional client server architecture, the server would die. So uh, it's uh, a proposed architecture to have a better scalability. Having a serverless architecture would, uh, so it's better because uh, these are cloud AWS is a cloud technology where we do not need to write custom code for setting up the communication protocols. AWS automatically sets it up for us, so that is less work for the developers. We do not worry about the hosting and deployment of the project that is handled by AWS. The only cons that we can see about the uh, serverless architecture using AWS Lambda is first, uh, the Architecture is dependent on AWS. We do need to have a server up and running every time we want to play a game, and it cannot be individually uh, distributed and hosted on uh, Docker. Uh, Docker could have certain limitations like uh, being system dependent or platform dependent. So that is the thought. And the cost of using AWS could vary directly proportional to the number of hits on the API gateway. So we might want to try and limit that number of hits to make the project cost efficient. Um, next slide, please. 
So this is when we talk about the object oriented design concepts. So reason we wanted to use the object oriented design concepts to develop the game is because the objects are reusable. They are more modular and easily extensible. We can add and remove attributes when we want. Uh, as and when the development progresses, there could be various modifications required to the game. Having an object-oriented design can make the process easier and uh, better for development. Over here, we can see that there is a game object. Game object is the top level of the game. And uh, that is when initially uh, we start with a, by creating a new game object, assigning an ID to it and adding players to it. The game can be saved like anytime players uh, choose to quit the game and come back, they can come back and resume the game from wherever they left off. The users are independent of the roles. Like uh, we can see that as the game object, we have the users who can be assigned to separate roles. So this makes it possible that a user can register himself and uh, be a part of multiple games, even at the same time. Uh, the game status is saved as complete and incomplete. As we talked about the game level, we have beginner, intermediate, and advanced. We can also see a scalable message structure uh, that can be part of the game rounds. So uh, the scalable game structure, we can have multiple options added to it later, as Julie mentioned. Uh, that is when a uh, player is sending a message from the uh, sender to the receiver. And we can also have various key choices. Uh, players can use their public, private, or symmetric key to encrypt the messages and maybe not even use any cryptographic, cryptographic function at all. So there's also another uh, attribute called cryptographic function. And the cryptographic type can be symmetric encryption, public key encryption, private key encryption, and hashing. So that is the level of flexibility we plan on adding to the game in future versions. And uh, that's next slide. Uh, Sudha. Yeah. Thank you, Akriti. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I will be walking you through the, uh, the current state of the game that we have and also what we have in the future uh, uh, for the game. Um, so in the current state, we have our first draft of the design in place where we have the architecture and the scalable uh, backend design and also the initial set of mockups to work uh, on the game. And uh, users are able to register themselves into the game and also log in um, so that once they log in, they'll be able to send and receive the messages. Um, the creation of the game and the assigning the users or the players to the game is done uh, in the backend and, uh, and it's done upfront. Um, although we would give the option of doing this by uh, to the end user uh, um, in the future. Um, we also have a structure of the message that is scalable. And like I said, the users will be able to send, send and receive messages uh, with the game that we have. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what we have coming up in the uh, sprint uh, two is we'll be developing the adversary view of the game wherein the adversary can view the messages or can modify or block or to that matter perform any other malicious action uh, that he can perform on the messages that exist between the players. And we also plan on developing the game logic, uh, which includes the game mechanics and the scoring logic uh, for the game. Next slide, please. And our uh, future vision, we have a couple of goals uh, in vision. Um, so we plan to have a, the architecture and design that is more scalable and more available. And we plan on improvising uh, our architecture and design that we already have, if required in future. And uh, like Akriti mentioned, we do not want the game to be dependent on any role of, uh, to be specific, uh, to be dependent on the game master. So we would want to make the uh, game independent of the game master, uh, which is one of our goals. 
um, and also we would want the user to be able to play uh, multiple games at the same time and not just restrict to one single game. Next slide, please. Uh, so right now what we have is we create the game and uh, the participants up front and we don't give this option uh, to the end user, but we plan on having this option of creating the game and inviting the players by the user that is uh, playing the game. Um, and the use, we also want to have the uh, users to have the flexibility of picking the roles that they want to um, before uh, they start with the game. And obviously, we would want our game to be available to wider audience and to be, able, uh, be deploying, deploying for a wider audience. Um, yeah, so this is the timeline that we have been uh, for the game. Uh, so the first, we have completed the prototype in December 2020. And the grant proposal, uh, uh, an outreach to DOD was made um, on Jan 2021, uh, in Jan 2021. And in the late March and early April, we have completed our sprint one and we are currently on sprint two, um, wherein we, uh, the users can, uh, will be able to uh, log in and send and receive messages. Um, we are, we should be having a playable demo by May uh, which is next month, uh, which includes the complete demo of the game. And uh, we are planning to have two concurrent games uh, with eight players and, of course, an adversary and a game master. And uh, we plan to have the first version, version 1.0, uh, by August 2021, with the difficulty levels that we have seen before, uh, the dif uh, several difficulty stages that the game can have. Um, with 30 concurrent users across more than three games. And then finally, we would want the game uh, to be uh, deployed by May 2022, uh, which includes the testing in the TOD classrooms. Next slide, please. Um, so we are a bunch of uh, developers, uh, with Akriti being the lead software developer. Uh, she has done a good job of comparing the several architectures and choose the one that best fits for the game. Um, of course, with the help of advisors and the other team members. Um, so she was able to figure out, uh, compare the serverless architecture and the client server based architecture um, and also come up with a scalable object design. Um, she's also responsible for the front end development using React. Um, uh, I in, work in coordination with Akriti for the front end development, developing the website using React and also the integration of the front end with the back end, which is SQL Alchemy, um, mainly creating the APIs. Uh, and we have our back end side of the team, Ryan and Julie, uh, both work on the database side, uh, the SQL Alchemy, which is the Python library. Uh, and uh, Ryan basically is uh, uh, responsible for maintaining the game integrity using the class server and uh, using the SQL algorithm to preserve the game state. While Julie is mainly responsible for the game balancing, uh, mainly the scoring logic and the game mechanics. And also all of, next slide please. And all of this wouldn't be possible, uh, obviously, with, uh, without our advisors. We have Dr. Ziegler, Dr. Sherman, Dr. Olano, and Dr. Oliva guiding us throughout the course of this uh, game. Uh, yeah, I guess that's all we had. Um, we are happy to take any questions. Thank you. Can you say a little bit more about um, what metrics you're going to collect and how you will use them to measure, to assess uh, student learning uh, against the uh, learning objectives. Right. Um, so, we believe in the basic philosophy that scoring should not be about individual player actions, but how they accomplish a goal. 
And this is a teaching sort of experience. We shouldn't be punishing every mistake. This is where they're supposed to make mistakes in a safe place. However, we feel like there should be some scoring for some not really scoring, but like commendations for certain actions like getting a pop-up for, hey, you finally encrypted a message or things like that, just to encourage players to work with established best practices as they're exploring what they can and cannot do. Network intruder model. Can you clarify a little bit about the adversarial thinking aspect? I mean, going through the um, the structure, I certainly see how this how the game is is set up technically, but um, I guess the goal, the overarching goal of the game, is for the players to exchange a message in a way that the adversary is not tampered with. Is is that kind of like the ultimate goal of of, of the game? Is that using adversarial thinking to enable this message to go from point A to point B successfully? Yes, to, to not only establish a message that somehow is untampered, but to establish some, some metric of belief that the message is untampered. So it's basically centering around the idea of um, exchanging a message for you know an encrypted message that that's got that maintains integrity. So it's sort of like adversarial thinking in a certain context, a certain situation, not adversarial thinking just generally. Is that fair? That's fair. Uh, Doctor Shaman, you're muted. Yeah. If um, in, in the context of um, network communications, the underlying problem is equivalent to the so-called Byzantine generals problem. And there are okay. solutions okay. to that problem provided uh, not more than a third of the um, users are corrupt. And in, in a more advanced version of the game, um, the adversary will have the capability to corrupt um, some of the users. Um, so as as students, as players develop more proficiency in winning the game, we also make the game a little more complicated by increasing the power of the adversary, so, such as to be able to okay. encrypt, uh, to corrupt more players. Um, it, is Ennis here? Um, he, he has um, several times um, fielded the paper and pencil game. And he reports to me this this interesting finding that even though students know that in principle an adversary can intercept and modify messages, somehow it doesn't strike home in a major way until they actually play the game and see this action happening to their own messages. That That's part of our so anecdotal evidence of, of why we think this gamification is going to have a significant um, learning outcome in helping um, students fully understand the powers of a, um, a network adversary. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. Th thanks, Alan. Thanks, Ryan. That puts this in context quite a bit because it wasn't clear at the outset, um, you know, sort of like the overarching context, but uh, you both cleared it up. So thank you. Um, especially because this is um, a work in progress. It just uh, started with this team fairly recently. We'd really appreciate any feedback, suggestions, comments um, you may have, because um, there's plenty of time to you know, change what we're doing in reaction to such feedback. You know, does sure. this sound I'll like an engaging game? Do, do you have any uh, suggestions for how, how we might improve the game? I would need, I, I would need to uh, think it through a little bit more. Uh, this is really my first sort of introduction to Meeting Mayhem. Uh, but I would need to read a little bit more about it and kind of get an I get a better idea of where it's heading. But I definitely see the um, applications of this being a great thing for security awareness. Like you like you were hinting at, Alan. People who you know they don't think it applies to them or affects them until they see it up close and personal. And if that can be demonstrated and proven in a game, 
in a safe environment, I think that has applications both for students in an academic environment, but certainly in a corporate or government environment as well as an awareness tool. Another unique aspect of what we're doing is that this game can be played by people who are not uh, STEM majors. Um, it, it should be able to be played by just about anyone. Um, whereas a, a lot of cybersecurity educational materials are restricted more to computer science majors or people heavily into STEM. Um, I totally agree. There's a, a CDL team um, that is currently developing a, a grant proposal to NSF to improve how cybersecurity is taught at the military academies, Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard. And interestingly, at each of these academies, they teach cybersecurity one semester freshman year to everyone. It's a required course. Uh, and that includes English majors, history majors, not just computer science majors. And we're hoping that um, we'll be able to um, uh, field a version of this game um, uh, in that context. That's interesting to, to hear. Um... I know the cybersecurity team training or education they, they do at Annapolis for all midshipmen is very computer science and computer engineering heavy. It's not uh, operationally focused, if you will, for like best practices, hygiene, being able to do something like what this game is trying to do. So there's definitely going to be, an, uh, I think, a, a need and a niche for something like Meeting Mayhem to fill um, across the board. Hi, I'm Russ Fink, uh, graduate 2010 of UMBC. I just wanted to say this idea is amazing. <laughs> Setting meetings is something that we have all learned how to do over the past year. And just the mere choice of this being a situation in which you're trying to set meetings, this is something that will touch absolutely everybody, a very wide uh, audience. So I think, you know, whoever came up with the idea that, you know, we can incorporate cybersecurity things, protocol analysis, little vignettes into that, uh, in, into the context of, hey, can I set a meeting with, you know, can Alice set a meeting with Bob in a way that Alice is sure it's Bob that's going to come to her meeting and everything else like that. Uh, I mean, that's, that's just great. I'm, I really like it. Uh, I would like to uh, share an example of, uh, a basic example of how, uh, uh, that was just an interesting discussion I had with Dr. Sherman a few weeks ago. So uh, let's say we are talking about how the game would progress. There was just a general idea that uh, we could generate symmetric keys initially and share it with all the players. So uh, players could use that symmetric key initially to send the messages safely across the receivers. Uh, after that, we can introduce a concept of uh, public key encryption and later just say that, hey, your symmetric key has been compromised. And players would be like, I had that key, I used it initially to share messages from the sender to the receiver, but now that key has been compromised to the adversary. What do I do? Players would think that. So since now I know the concept of public key encryption, can I generate a unique key or a symmetric key and share it with my receiver? And that is how uh, they would learn that, okay, maybe this is a way to generate new keys that the adversary would not be knowing. And uh, that is how you can trick the adversary into uh, successfully transmitting the messages intended from sender to player. There's an opportunity for much more uh, open-ended thinking through this game. Uh, typically, exchanging things with um, asymmetric cryptography requires a pre-established trust relationship. Like, I, I know your certificate and I believe your certificate because it's been issued by VeriSign or whatever. What if we were to blow this open more wide and say, um, Alice, there's this guy out there, Bob, that you should meet with. 
you don't know who Bob is and you've never met Bob before, you have an email address, but that's about it. Uh, what kinds of, you know, ask the game participants, what ways would Alice have of verifying Bob is the right Bob and that when you send a meeting request and he accepts and comes to the meeting that he is in fact the correct Bob? You know, this could get into deeper avenues of how do you establish zero knowledge proofs of identity? How do you establish that initial trust relationship if you don't have things like PKI? Uh, you know, just, just encourage participants to come up with creative ways of how they would, you know, authenticate somebody. You know, even the use of out of band channels. I mean, that's a concept you have to learn. You know, well, I could just call Bob up on the phone and say, hey, here's the meeting code. You know, that's an out of band channel. You, you should let people come to that conclusion on their own. And once they do, they'll realize the value of it. I think it's a really good suggestion. Um, you know, we had been thinking that, you know, one possible future direction of this game is we could expand the scope of problems that they would solve. And, and I very much like, you know, your specific suggestion of doing something about um, authentication. Um, what Akriti was talking about was sort of theme and variation of that, um, which it was a clever way to solve two problems. One was we we need to introduce new concepts in a very gradual way, and it seemed like it, it made sense to introduce symmetric encryption before asymmetric encryption. And then um, we also want, as students master proficiency in the game, to make it more complicated. And, and one way to make it more complicated is you can disrupt the status quo of the game by, for example, announcing that people's symmetric keys were compromised. And that would motivate them to have to establish a new trust relationship by establishing, exchanging asymmetric keys, the public keys. And, and what you're saying, Russ, you know, could, could be part of that or it could be done separately. Um, so yeah, I'm, I and we we welcome you know suggestions, general or specific, for you know other ways we could push the game in in that sense. I also think uh, thinking back to some of the uh, various CTF competitions that I've run over the years, uh, for as the game develops, you might want to include um, in within the game environment a notepad or a way for for players to record thoughts or observations or questions about what they're encountering or ideas they've come up with that could then both help them, but be used as a sort of a feedback loop to learn and improve the challenge across the board, you know, um, at, from the adversarial side and also from the, the game design side. Uh, so that might be something to consider is like having a, a player scratch pad, if you will, or that even a feedback loop that you could, they could send observations or questions to the game master uh, as they're, as they're progressing. Yeah, I like that. I, I guess um, we we had thought about having questionnaires after the game, but maybe it makes more sense also to have the ability to make such commentary during the game when the when the thoughts are fresh. Um, we we always had in mind this philosophy of self discovery. So instead of like the game master didactically telling people, oh well, you should learn about encryption and signatures and hashing, our our model is more after encountering failures, the student should get the idea like, like maybe it would be useful to be able to encrypt. And then with a, uh, a communication with the game master, the game master then could enable that functionality. And then um, as uh, the speakers were explaining, we also want a version of this where we don't depend on a sophisticated game master. So that sort of progression could also be handled through having more automatic formal levels of the game where there are different problems and capabilities at each level. Exactly. I was, I was even thinking, uh, you know, longer term game extension, there could be uh, scripts or scanners that could detect what and parse what the players are typing as like notes or commentaries or, or questions. And then over time, maybe give them drop some breadcrumb hints along the way, say, you know, just to kind of nudge them if, if it detects they're being stuck or trapped for too long. 
um, so they don't get fed up and just quit. Because a lot of a lot of players, when they hit a challenge, they'll just throw up their hands and say, "Up, oh, forget it. I give up." And we want to make sure they learn from this too. So there could be an AI component at some point, uh, maybe. And all, all games require a tuning of parameters to make sure you know it's the appropriate challenge and interest, um, so you don't discourage people or you don't bore them. A technical detail might be you have to create some scenarios for a human game master to to carry out, depending on who's playing the game, what's their overall skill level, you know, coming into it. Do we expect them to be more, you know, are they IT workers versus uh, people that aren't computer people? And uh, to that to that level, when you're thinking about a game masterless mode, you might want to have the ability to script a bunch of scenarios with some of the things that were talked about, including hints that can be dropped. You know, so you could have canned scripts that kind of walk through, depending on who it is, and you can just play, plug a different script in, depending on which audience is playing it, and and also how many people are playing the game too. Um, Ennis also has, you know. Oh, he's here. I see. Um, pointed out that um, you know, you you could conceivably automate the adversary. I think you're specifically talking about AI to the game master, but you could also do AI to the adversary. And we use a formal methods tool called CPSA to analyze cryptographic protocols. And and Ennis views basically the adversary as, as something that uh, CPSA does. In fact, CPSA does it better than any human. And Conceivably, one could even somehow automate the adversary by using CPSA. Um, Ennis, do you want to share any of your experiences um, doing the paper and pencil game? Um, sure. Is there, are there any in experiences that are specifically interesting or relevant like, to the conversation here? Um, well, I, why don't you select what you think is most interesting? Um, well, I guess I can address some of the stuff we've talked about. So scripting the game seems doable, given the fact that almost every single time I've played this game, which is like a non-trivial amount of times now, right? Like I'm probably at six or seven proper plays. Um, the game kind of works the same way. Um, it goes through the same sequences of progression, the same phases, if you will. And it, this seems to largely be regardless of how experienced the students are. But often you'll see people start with, you know, simple ideas and they'll realize those ideas don't work once they grasp the adversary, right? So like a big part of this game and what it's supposed to teach is like, what is the adversary you're dealing with when you're doing protocol security? And even for somebody well-versed in security, it's often eye-opening, like the Dolophial adversary, if you've never seen it before, right? Oh, with what Ennis is talking about, I can think of, uh, so I think we had discussed about uh, the future challenges of the game. So uh, once an adversary or a player is fully educated, how do we make the game interesting for those players again? So uh, that that is maybe something that uh, we need to figure out by adding more strategies to the game so that the strategies are dynamic and players do not know what to expect. The players in the adversary do not know what to expect. Uh, maybe a game like Among Us that you would still like to play over and over again, um, uh, having so-called the, the adversaries, you, you can just say. Uh, so that is another important aspect uh, of making the game still interesting uh, after being fully educated. And, and one option is the players can try their hand at being the adversary. It's sort of interesting that you're trying to tackle this problem because I have a very elegant solution, but but not in the context of the game, unfortunately. My hope is that as students become more advanced and they become more proficient at this game, they want to play it for real, in real life, with real protocols, right? That's the whole purpose of the educational modules that we've developed, and sort of the game is a crucial part of that. Um, Anis, can you talk about your observations about how the gameplay helped people develop adversarial thinking? So 
I don't know if I can address broadly how it helps them develop adversarial thinking, but definitely it teaches the adversarial model very quickly. Very, very quickly students figure out, oh, wow, the enemy is going to carry every message and it can touch any message that we that we hand to it. Like they re recognize the, the network is hostile essentially almost immediately. And because they realize the network is hostile, now they have to think about the adversary applying one of several discrete actions to any message they put into the network. So from the get-go, you're thinking at every step about what is the adversary going to do to this message that I send. And I think this is sort of the mindset, at least, that you want to be in when you're dealing with security a little bit. But also that's like an opinion, right? I think the benefit of this game, though, is while you can certainly attract people to do protocol analysis and things, I mean, there are just some really fundamental security information, knowledge, and facts that they could really gain, you know, insights that they can gain from playing this game that goes much beyond protocol analysis. And really, it can teach. So the, the big message is that, like it or not, information security is something we all have to deal with. We heard about 530 million people from Facebook, their information getting doxxed, essentially. And then LinkedIn came up with this other uh, revelation. I think it was in today's news about things. You know, the thing is, we need to teach people to be careful with their information on the internet. And something like this kind of a game has the potential to teach that lesson in a way that's safe, in a way that they know, okay, if I give away too much information, this is what something bad that's going to happen to me. And, you know, so it goes much beyond just, just you know, protocol analysis and thing, which which is very important, but it really kind of gets to the core of, hey, we need to teach people to be smarter about information security. That's the only way we're going to win against adversaries that are determined to get into our networks. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting observation. And the choice to make the scenario somewhat based around meetings, and it wasn't inspired by COVID, right? Um, but but certainly COVID has made it a more powerful example on some level. But this this idea of meeting was was specifically selected because I assumed literally anybody that would be playing the game has in, at some point in their lives had to meet with somebody else somewhere. So it was just like one of those things where where you've done it before, the thing. Um, we we've taken a pretty strong position on the fact that we think that that learning protocol analysis is a great way to learn about security in general. But it's also true that you could just skip the part where you learn specifically about protocols and use this as like a general a general tool to help people who are not security, who don't have security backgrounds appreciate the finer points of security a little bit. That said, um, I have never seen somebody play the game that doesn't have at least some sort of computing background of some kind. I don't know how the game would be received by somebody that has never for instance, programmed before or something like that, right? I haven't tried that. I'd be curious to see how that goes. Well, that kind of leads to my next question. I was going to ask the team, what are your plans for a, a pilot? You know, is this the kind of thing you can pilot to the UMBC community? I, I know that Alan has had some success doing things like that in the past with uh, voting and also with um, awareness of, uh, you know, are you visiting an HTTPS connection regarding some banking application? This is probably a decade and a half ago, but what, what are your plans for piloting? I think at this time we, we don't have specific plans and um, we need to think about it. Um, uh, maybe Dr. Olano has some suggestions um, I, uh, other than if, if this uh, project with the military academy succeeds, then um, that will be one source of testing. Um, uh, certainly, we, we'd like to to pilot it at UMBC. Um, well, in 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 person years, projects with undergrads involved can uh, can also um, present at ERCAD. Well, I mean, ERCAD is happening. That's the Undergraduate Research and Creative Achievement Day. It's happening this year and last year online, but. Um, uh, and we, I have some game projects that are trying to present there, but in, in the in-person years, you can actually get people to um, play your game as they're coming through, uh, which is harder when it's, uh, um, 
and you observe them. I mean, you can get them to play the game remotely, uh, but it's harder for you to sort of observe them uh, and and see kind of how the game is going uh, at, for that part of its remote. Not not to mention that we missed the deadline for it anyway. I think we, you know, the deadline was January. Um, uh, can also get some gameplay in some classes, right? So if, if you, and it doesn't just have to be the security classes, right? If you um, uh, um, either, you know, some you know, friendly computer science professor or a friendly education professor could potentially uh, um, get students to try, try playing the game. So those are, I mean, basically classes in ERCAT are the main places I, I see games uh, or try and get games played. I saw a post on LinkedIn recently about computing plus X or some initiative where uh, UMBC, I think Yoshi, Professor Yoshi was going to, was rolling this one out where in the fall they're going to start a program where you can tack on some sort of a, I don't know if it's a minor or a minor concentration. So if you're in a non-computing field, you can take these classes and gain some, you know, computer experience type of thing. I wonder, so my question would be, A, is there, two questions. First question, is there some sort of information security uh, theme being taught in that program? And the second question would be uh, really more of a statement. I think this type of an application would be really a, a fun thing to run and useful thing to run in that sort of program. Okay, uh, I would uh, also uh, like to take this opportunity to discuss about the uh, architecture and the object diagram, since uh, that is going to be composing of my master's thesis. Uh, any comments, any suggestions, or any improvements? Uh, Anything uh, I would really appreciate if uh, anyone needs to talk about the uh, so my master thesis is going to compose about the comparison of the two architectures and also coming up uh, with the object oriented design that uh, we see around here. So any comments or suggestions or feedbacks uh, would be appreciated. This diagram is in UML, right? Uh, yeah, kind of the object diagram. Good. Well, if people have any additional, you know, comments, um, I invite them to, you know, email us or talk to us um, afterwards. So thank you so much. Um, it was, a, I think, a successful session. And in two weeks, we'll be back with more adversarial thinking by Dr. Peter Peterson. I hope everybody has a good weekend. Bye. Take care. Thank you, for everyone, for your feedback. See you in two weeks. I am looking at this diagram, and I have, like, one comment, I guess. Uh -huh. So it looks like you're strictly defining roles, right? Like, you have five roles, yeah. and they seem, like, rigidly defined. But it might be helpful to think of a role as a bundle of abilities and privileges rather than something you hard code, right? Yeah, so uh, basically these roles, we just designed to make things simple. And all these roles uh, would have the abilities that you just mentioned. Uh, it's just that we define them for making things a little bit simpler for implementation and working of the game. I think it's not inconsistent with what you're saying, Ennis. I mean, you can still have a role, and then there can be a separate list of capabilities of each um, role. We're also intentionally 
trying to start with a simple design using agile development. So we, we want to get a playable, simple playable version of the game up and running as soon as possible. And then later we can add complexity. But I, I think we, we always had in mind that th there's going to be some sort of capability system that um, the players and the adversary um, have, will have certain combinations of capabilities. We had that in mind for like encryption tools, but Ennis is going even more general, like spectator is in a role, uh, the capability to view other people's messages. <laughs> That's the entire thing about spectator. So, good feedback. It's like a super interesting project though. It's cool to see what you guys are doing. 